The father of two murdered in a targeted hit. The son, he just sits there and waits, hoping that his dad will come and pick him up from school. The suspected drug traffickers filmed by surveillance teams. And the inside story of how detectives caught the Stepping Hill poisoner. What's most significant is the lack of poisonings when Victorino Chua is not working on that ward. Live for the next hour, this is Crime Watch. And welcome to Crime Watch. I'm standing in for Kirsty tonight and bringing you 60 minutes of the latest crime investigations, news, and appeals. We have dozens of detectives from all over the UK. They're here, they're ready to take your calls and to crack cases. Yes, yeah, so we've had great results with Wanted Faces recently, so let's see what we can do with tonight's lineup. Plus, caught on camera, the moment a gang ambushed a father and his seven year old son on their way to the post office. I'm Sonali Shah, here this month with the latest crime news and updates, including how an on-the-run murderer was caught just hours after our last programme, all thanks to an eagle-eyed viewer. With the help of the public, it being absolutely fantastic, we've located a dangerous offender. Well, we begin tonight with a chilling and seemingly targeted murder of a father of two outside his family business in South Shields last month. There's no apparent motive, so police do need your help to understand why anyone would want to kill 32-year-old Tipu Sultan. Thirty-two-year-old Tipu Sultan has helped to run the family business in South Shields since he was a teenager. Hello. Good night. The takeaway Herbs and Spice Kitchen has been open for 20 years. The business has always been there as long as we can remember. It was a family business, but it wasn't really a family. It was Tipu's. Everything inside out Tipu knew about it. Tipu was the oldest, and Dad has difficulties too in everyday things. And from a very young age, Tipu was always helping Dad. So Dad was always dependent on Tipu. He was like the head of the family. Tipu took on that responsibility of helping everyone out. He was an amazing person. You have that one person in your life where that person is always smiling. You never see them sad. He was that person. He had an impact on everyone's life. Tipu died almost instantly from a single gunshot wound to the neck. Police are now studying footage from the surrounding area. In terms of CCTV, what we have is where the bike first is seen prior to the offence is on Lumley Avenue. It tracks down Lumley Avenue before turning into a, a little cul-de-sac. 
the offenders have had to bump the motorcycle onto a curb and across a little path, which takes them onto Prince Edward Road. Um, they're seen at that location by two witnesses at a bus stop, looking either way up and down Prince Edward Road before crossing um, the main road. Once they cross into Lake Avenue, they don't come past the front of the shop. Um, they actually go into the rear lane behind the shop, which is where the witnesses actually describe the pillion passenger getting off and the motorcyclists making ready uh, at the cut um, that is adjacent to the back of the shop, ready to pick him up as soon as the shooting's taken place. You see the bike speeding away from there and down onto the coast road. We have CCTV which actually takes them away from the scene of the crime. The bike travels along a road called Lizard Lane before taking a left-hand turn down towards the coast road. As it comes onto the coast road, travels a short distance. We have it on CCTV from in a garage and then again from a local school. It turns into Marsden Avenue. And that's the last sight we have of the motorbike. We had a witness uh, come forward shortly afterwards, um, indicating that on some rural land uh, a fire had started and parts of a motorcycle had been burnt out at that location. And it's so close to the commission of offence and the type of bike that we're talking about. Um, somebody may have knowledge about that bike or may have helped in the burning out of that bike for a reason and we would appeal for those people to come forward. Call the police. Call them. Son. Hello. Hello, you're doing the police out in the house? Well, somebody coming in the back. I shoot you my son. Shot your son. Can you send the ambulance and regular please? What, you want an ambulance as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my son died. Please. Where? Where is my son? I know my father is absolutely killing on the inside. You will never imagine a father having to bury his son. To shoot somebody with a shotgun from half a metre away through the throat, cold blooded killing, uh, and make off from the scene. Uh, somebody, to all intents and purposes, who is very much a pillar of the society, well-known, well-respected, polite, considerate, young father, uh, to murder somebody in cold blood like that. Yeah, particularly dangerous people and people that we need to catch. <laughs> His wife is broken in a million pieces. Oh, that's how I can explain it. She's not the person she was. She's just dead inside, if I'm honest, because she loved him a bit and she just doesn't know how to live now. And with these kids, I think the youngest the girl who's two, she doesn't really understand yet, but the son, his dad would pick him up from school every day. We have to go and pick him up now, and you can still see that in his eyes. He's looking at you and he's smiling, but really he's looking for his dad. He just, he just sits there and waits, hoping that his dad will come and pick him up from school. Well, Detective Chief Inspector John Bent, who you saw in that film, is leading the investigation. And John, it is such a horrific attack and took place in front of Tipu's father. I mean, you talk to the family a lot. How are they dealing with this? They're being very brave, Sean, but the realisation that they're never going to see their husband, son, brother mm. uh, again, I think it, it must be very difficult to deal with. Um, still very much grieving, but they've been very brave and they've been incredibly supportive of the police investigation. Yeah, well, let's hope we can find who did it. Now, talk us through the CCTV. We saw the bike, the route that it took. Where did it go? Yeah, it, it, after the offence actually took place uh, at the rear of the Herbs and Spices uh, takeaway, we know that the vehicle left at very high speed um, from Lake Avenue mm -hmm. and it travelled from the back of the Herbs and Spices kitchen all the way along Lizard Lane 
and then it took a, a left-hand turn there along Kitchener Road onto the Coast Road before disappearing in Marsden Avenue, and that's the last sighting we actually have at the bike. But as well at the scene, we also had a small silver car, Fiesta Corsa, that was there slightly before the shooting took place, and we're very keen for anybody that might have seen that vehicle too to come forward. OK, and you've got some new CCTV footage that you want to show us, and crucially, somebody who you'd like to talk to. Absolutely. It, it, this is the first time tonight that we've released this CCTV um, footage. Uh, it's of somebody just before the commission of the offence, quite a distinctive person, thick, dark hair, uh, recognisable clothes, light-coloured polo shirt. That person was in the area just before the shooting and we think may well be a very significant witness and would really appeal for any member of the public that would recognise that person or if anybody's watching and it is them to come forward. They may well have seen something really significant. That so time. you want to trace him, also that bike and those burnt out remains. I mean, what more can you tell us about that and how yeah. significant it is? Uh, I'm keeping a very open mind about the bike parts that we recovered. Um, it was reported a week after the commission of the offence. However, it was actually seen being burnt out the day after. So very close, in a fairly near proximity to where this happened, only a few miles away. It's a similar type bike to we know that was used during the offence. And all the recognisable features of that bike have been removed, which are, is suspicious in its own right. So yeah. It may be involved, it may not have been, but if somebody legitimately did burn that bike out, we would ask them to come forward so we can eliminate it. All right, we should just say as well, you've got somebody from the Bangladeshi community who's helping out on your team, so if there are any language issues, you can deal with that. Absolutely. Detective, thank you very much. Think of that family left behind and what they're going through now. If you have any idea why Tipu was murdered or you think you know who did it, then please do call John and the team in the studio now. The number, as ever, is 0500 600 600. A roundup of the latest crime news now, and police in London are tonight appealing for your help to catch a dangerous rapist who attacked a woman as she made her way home. The woman was walking in the Grove Park area of Lewisham at 2.45 a.m. on the 8th of March when the man held her at knife point and raped her. This chilling footage shows him following her shortly before it happened. During the ordeal, he demanded her bank card and PIN number, and this CCTV of the suspect shows him using a cash point a short time later. Well, the attacker is described as being black, aged 25 to 40, and was wearing a sky blue cloth hat and Chelsea Adidas top. Police have a full DNA profile. All they need now is a name. If you recognise him, please call the studio now. A man has amazingly survived being shot after his mobile phone took the brunt of the blast. The 25-year-old victim was fired at with this gun after he approached a group of teenagers last October outside the block of flats where he lived in Widnes. Police re released this incredible photo of the damaged phone this week. 19-year-old Ryan Duggan was found guilty of attempted murder and possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life. He'll be sentenced in July. Now, Operation Captura, the national crime agency and Crime Stoppers campaign to track down some of Britain's most serious suspected criminals thought to be hiding out in Spain, is tonight revealing exclusive new surveillance footage on Crime Watch. Steve Reynolds, the deputy director of the NCA, is here. Thank you very much for being here, Steve. I'll ask you about the surveillance in just a moment, but first, remind us how much Captura has achieved so far. Well, we launched Captura in 2006, uh, since which time of the 86 fugitives that we've been trying to find, 68 have been arrested. So now is the time for a final push on the remaining 18. And they include men who have committed murder, rape and drug trafficking. Tell us about some of the men you have here, starting with Anthony Dennis and this surveillance footage you have. Yes, well, this is Anthony Dennis. We believe that he is a leading member of an organised crime group involved in high-level international drug trafficking, including the importation of around three tonnes of, of cocaine directly into Europe from South America. Yes, and tonight uh, we can reveal for the first time some surveillance footage of Dennis. Here he is outside a cafe in Rotterdam. Now, prior to this uh, 
the, the, this cafe being raided by the Dutch police. We believe that it was being used as a rendezvous and hub for drug traffickers. I would say if anyone knows where Dennis is now, I would urge them to get in touch tonight. Hopefully someone can help you tonight. Who else have you got left on your list here? Well, here we have uh, David McDermott. Uh, he's wanted for conspiracy to import cocaine and conspiracy to blackmail. Again, we have some surveillance footage. Here you see McDermott in meetings with other criminals uh, and they're planning the recovery of £72 million worth of cocaine. During that discussion, um, McDermott was uh, discussing his, uh, the use of physical and sexual violence in order to recover the drugs. What he didn't know was that we had already recovered and seized the drugs that were contained in 16 holdalls that were found in a container of Argentinian beef. Wow. Now you have two more men in particular you're after. Yes. Uh, this is Derek Ferguson, wanted in connection with the murder of Thomas Cameron, who was shot on the 28th of June 2007 in the Orkinan Tavern um, in Bishop's Brig near Glasgow. And Robert uh, Mortby, who is wanted uh, for a number of offences, including attempted murder and the possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life. We believe that he was one of three men who attacked another man in a pub in London. Steve, thank you very much. Well, you heard the man. If you know where any of these men are, call the studio now. For more details on all 18 of these faces, head to the website. Now, in Belfast, earlier this month, Gerard or Jock Davison was shot dead in a residential street as he made his way to work. The 47-year-old was formerly a senior IRA figure, but police do not believe that dissident Republicans were behind the attack or that his murder was sectarian. I'm joined now by Detective Superintendent Kevin Geddes. Kevin is from the Police Service of Northern Ireland. Uh, thanks for joining us, Kevin. Talk us through what happened first. Uh, Jock Davidson was murdered on Tuesday the 5th of May at round about nine minutes past nine in the morning. Um, he was walking to work in the Wealth Street area of the markets in Belfast when a gunman shot him in the back and then shot him four times in the head. You have a good description of the gunman, don't you? Yes, indeed. Um, the gunman is described as being around five feet six inches tall. Mm -hmm. The gunman was wearing a dark coat, a waterproof coat, similar to the one I'm holding here um, with a hood. The gunman we know stood over Jock Davidson um, and then calmly walked away um, from the scene of the shooting across into an alleyway that leads into the back of Stanfield Place. And you know he was in the area at the time, before the shooting happened in fact. Yes, we've had some really good support from, from the local community and um, we have uh, potential witnesses or um, potentially the gunman seen standing down round near the junction of Wealth Street and Macaulay Street round about 20 to 9 in that morning. Very similar description, um, in one case described as holding a red and white plastic bag. We'd be very keen to hear from these people if, if you're not involved. Um, as I say, please get in touch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about the gun and the ammunition used, because it was quite unusual, wasn't yes, it? Yes, uh, the ammunition is described as Makarov 9mm ammunition. This ammunition is slightly smaller in size than traditional um, 9mm ammunition. It's Eastern European made. Um, it will only fire in a Makarov type handgun, similar to the one that we see here. It's very, very rare um, in Northern Ireland and we would like to know how did this Makarov handgun and how did that ammunition get into Northern Ireland? Mm -hmm. The area where this happened was the markets area and we're, we're talking about just after nine o'clock on a weekday morning. Presumably it would have been quite busy at that time. Yes, the markets area is a very busy residential area. Um, we believe um, it's very close to Belfast city centre um, and a number of people we know park their cars there and would walk to work. And we particularly like to hear from people who may not even realise that they were close to the scene of this. If you parked your car there three weeks ago today, um, please get in touch with us. All right, so Tuesday, May the 5th, just after 9 o'clock, if you're in the markets area, then, then you'd like yes, to hear please, from people. Yes. Uh, Jock Davison, we talked about his IRA past, his former IRA past. Do you think that might be stopping people coming forward with information? 
Chuck Davidson did have a past, but there's absolutely no justification for what happened that day. No one has the right to take the law into their own hands. There's a very dangerous gunman out there. Um, Chuck Davidson was brutally gunned down in a busy residential area very close to a primary school. Um, we need to catch this gunman. We would appeal for anybody who has any information about the gunman or indeed saw anybody acting suspiciously in the area in the days or weeks leading up to this to please get in touch with us. All right. Thank you very much, Detective. As he said, the gunman needs to be caught. Do call us on the usual number 0500 600 600 if you think you can help. Wanted faces now and the first four tonight are classed as dangerous and should not be approached. Just dial 999 if you know where they are. This is Justin Clark, although you may know him as Martin Maher. Detectives in Hertfordshire want to speak to him about the murder of a man in 1993 who was shot in his car at point-blank range. Clark is 59 and has links to Birkenhead, Oxfordshire and London, as well as Ireland, Croatia and Qatar. Faces two and three are husband and wife Patrick and Constance Adams. They're wanted for questioning in connection to a shooting in Islington in North London in 2013, in which a man was shot in the chest. The victim spent over a month in hospital recovering from his injuries. Patrick is 59 and also known as Patsy. Constance is 55 and sometimes uses the surname Scannell. Both have London accents and could be in Spain, the Netherlands or Dubai. Finally, for now, we have 33-year-old Imran Hussein, although he also calls himself Ofran, Abra or Imi. Detectives want to speak to him following the discovery of crack cocaine and heroin worth £2 million. Hussein has friends and family in Rochdale and Leeds. We'll go through the rest of the lineup a little later, but remember, these first four are described as dangerous, so call 999 immediately if you know where they are. Right, still to come tonight, the terrifying moment a gang ambushed a father and son in the middle of the street and the raid on a couple's home in a sleepy Essex village. I'm not leaving till I have the money. You have a safe. I've been told. They were demanding to see our safe. They were convinced we had a safe. Don't lie to There's me. No safe. But first, this month's CCTV Roundup, and I have to warn you, it's a particularly nasty collection. The driver of this car has just pulled over to talk to a friend in Luton. As they chat, two men run from a waiting car and, without warning, try to drag the victim from behind the wheel. As he desperately tries to drive away, one of the men launches a sickening attack, repeatedly hitting the victim over the head with a hammer. They then drag him from his car before one of them stamps on his head. The attack nearly killed the victim, with bone from his skull being driven into his brain. He's been left permanently disabled. Police also want to trace this man, who they believe was with the attackers minutes earlier. Can you name the thugs responsible? These men are chatting in a takeaway late at night in Bournemouth. Without warning, one of the men swings a vicious punch, knocking his victim to the floor. The thug then casually walks away, leaving the man unconscious and motionless. The victim was days away from qualifying as a pilot, but the attack left him with a bleed on the brain, which means his career plans are now on hold. Who is the violent man responsible? Name, please. A man in a red hat and his mate have arrived at an all-night party at a flat in Birmingham. The problem is, they're not invited. Later, an argument breaks out between the man, who now no longer has his hat, and another party-goer. The gatecrasher and his victim then go outside to sort things out. But as he gets to the doorway, the attacker reaches into his pocket for what police believe is a knife. Once outside, a fight breaks out. During the struggle, the victim is stabbed eight times and nearly loses his life. Can you name his attacker?
This 78-year-old man walks into a bank in Watford to withdraw a large amount of his savings. Whilst inside, he laughs and jokes with the cashiers before leaving with £10,000 in two brown envelopes. Police believe this man is loitering outside, waiting, but the victim is totally unaware. At the very top of the screen, you can see the pensioner walking to his car, parked outside the bank. Suddenly, the man grabs him from behind and throws him to the ground, running off with his hard-earned cash. He's seen here still running minutes later, clasping the stolen envelopes. Do you know this despicable thief? Call and text the numbers on screen if you can help. And of course, it's all on the Crime Watch website. Now, early one evening in February, three men who were armed with crowbars, a knife and a sledgehammer stormed into the Essex home of John and Mary Cunningham. For nearly an hour, the couple were kicked and beaten as the thugs made increasingly desperate demands for their cash. Tonight, the Cunninghams are hoping you can help get this gang behind bars before they strike again. My mother bought this little cottage in 1963, and uh, it's been in the family since then. I like the place, it's got a sort of character in the garden, and just, it's our home. It's, it's the centre point of my life. John and I have been married nearly 35 years. Um, we've both got big birthdays this year, and uh, really a year to celebrate. A sort of special year on the calendar. It's a relationship that I think is very strong, because we work together. We're virtually in each other's pockets 24 hours a day. And what can I say? She's she's um, backbone of my my marriage, my life, my my business. It was a normal Friday. Um, I had been working. We run a business from the office above the garage. I don't know about other people, but when you come to Friday afternoon, you have that sort of feeling. You know, week's finished. Look forward to the weekend. I finished work about four o'clock in our yard, it, which is about three miles from here. Came home about quarter past four. It's getting sort of dusky then. Thanks very much, all of you. We'll get to know more about each of you throughout the show as it goes along. So that just leaves one more person for me to introduce. Google Glass was... I looked out over the road and I saw this car um, with people in it just sitting, staring in. No lights on the car. I thought this is a bit strange. John? I, I am well. Oh, I'm home. <laughs> Hi. Didn't think any more of it. This year, we were going to have a very special holiday uh, because our wedding anniversary we had our brochures on the table. Literally, on the day, we had finalised the insurance and everything. We were looking forward to that. I heard a sort of, like, a shuffling at the back door. What's your money? What's it? The door burst open. They switched the lights off and came bouncing through them, shouting and swearing, and on the floor, on the floor, with these crowbars. What are you doing in my home? You have a safe. I've been... And I immediately noticed crowbars, and one had a sledgehammer. Um. What are they going to do to us? We haven't got any. Where is the safe? There is no safe. I said naively, oh, here you are. I have the money out of my wallet, my purse. Here's money. The purse is mine. Take this. Take this. And I said, take the car keys. Here's the car keys. Take the car keys. Go. No, no, no. You've got a safe. No. Shut up. Um, and I got a slap to be quiet. Mary! I got the leather glove over my mouth and told to shut up. Oh, shut shut up. up! What are you doing? I know you have a safe. Where is it? Oh, oh, geez, oh, we haven't got a safe. There is a <laughs> There was um, one who did most of the uh, talking um, and seemed to be... Well, he obviously told the others what to do. Oh. Go find the safe!
They ransack the place in bedrooms and parcels and pulling drawers out looking for cash. Our son's old bedroom, he'd got some loose change and some foreign currency in a drawer up there, which I, I didn't even know was there. I think it was some euros and some, I think it was about 20, 30 quid in cash. And then he, they found that and they thought, oh, this is exciting. Uh, I think there's more there. You lied! By then, I mean, I was shaking with fear. John was dragged from the floor. Um, and taken through to the study, and the door closed. Oh, no, you have money. He found about a thousand pounds, twelve hundred pounds in the desk drawer, paid cash. I know you have more. That's when he gave me a bit of a pasting. There is more money. What is the That's all the money there is. Don't lie to me. Don't lie to me. I was sitting in the kitchen um, with the third one um, watching me. I was concerned because I could hear raised voices. It was just a horrible feeling, not knowing where it would end because they were demanding to see our safe. They were convinced we had a safe, um, which we don't. He was brought out. John, John. I think John said, you got our money and you're going. They said, no, what's over there? Over Being dragged over to the office frightened me. He didn't put me in a hammerlock, but he was right beside me, kept pushing me with his knees. He was getting very, very agitated and very, very impatient. Where is the safe? There's no safe. There it is. Oh, and then he went mad. He started um, tearing into things, all through the drawers, and pulling files out. And he was getting pretty fed up with me. Need me hard in the in the kidneys, which really I, I thought I was going to pass out. The adrenaline was there, for the fight to start with, and then I think that runs out. You have like a, a defeated feeling. There's something very degrading about somebody standing over you with a crowbar. There's something sordid about it. He couldn't find anything else, so he marched me down the stairs and back over to the, to the cottage here, to the kitchen. Ah, no! They grabbed an apron the off the Let's back go. of the kitchen door, laid it on the table, put all the money in it, and left. That was sheer relief. We're just out of our, out of our house. I wouldn't call them people, to be honest. Um, I mean, they're not human beings, as I recognize human beings. Sewer rats, they come in uninvited, don't they? They pick at people's lives, scavenged, horrible, dirty. Mm, I think I'll stick with sewer rats. It's a scar. I think it's going to take a long, long time to get over it. They're Romans, and by God, I hope they get caught. I desperately hope they get caught. And with your help, they will be. DS Michael Pennell is leading on this case. This was so horrific, so brutal on John and Mary. Why were they targeted, do you think? Well, they were convinced that they had a safe and they don't have a safe. John and Mary run a small local business. Mm. They had some savings in the house which they sort of put together towards their anniversary. Mary called them sewer rats. Do we know anything about the, the men who did it, the weapons they were carrying? They've been described as Eastern European and that comes from their accents. Um, they were wearing tough workwear. Two had black jackets, one had a dark green or khaki colored jacket on. Um, with a distinctive logo across all three, which starts on the chest and moves across to the arm, which looks something like what we've got here on the screen. Mm, okay, and what do we know about the car they used? Well, the car was described um, by John as being dark in appearance, mm -hmm. and that's about as much as we've got, so we haven't got a specific make and model. Mm -hmm. And what we do know is it was parked on the boundary of their property, right by a bend on the road, so anyone that would have been driving along that road would have had to swerve to avoid it. 
which is certainly one of our appeal points. Someone may have been there and seen that. And we also know that there was a vehicle parked opposite um, shortly before the offence took place, which John saw, which he thought may have been a Volkswagen. But again, we're not sure. We just know it was a dark vehicle. OK. John and Mary, clearly very affected by this. How are they now? It was a very distressing ordeal for them to go yeah. through. Well, they have made a full recovery. And they've tightened security as well, we should say, at the cottage, haven't they? We've supported them with that, and they've installed an extensive alarm and CCTV system, which is obviously going to deter any future occurrences. Finally, there is a reward on this case. That's right. There's a £5,000 Crime Stoppers Award, which has been um, put out there to hopefully catch these people. All right. And that's for any information that leads to the arrest and uh, any conviction. Information any information that leads to the arrest, arrest and conviction. OK, thanks very much for clarifying that. John and Mary do not want this happening to anyone else. If you know anything, please do help. Call now on the usual number 0500 600 600. Of course, you can speak anonymously to Crime Stoppers. Let me give you that number. It's 0800 555 111. And remember, if you have been a victim of crime, you can call the Victim Support Line. This is the number 08 08 16 89 1. Still to come tonight, the inside story of how the Stepping Hill Hospital poisoner was caught. There is only one member of staff who was on duty and working on those three occasions, and that was Victorino Chua. But first, time for our second batch of wanted faces, starting with Lewis Okai. He was jailed for seven years for three robberies and one attempted robbery and released early on licence, but he's failed to stick to the conditions of his release and is now wanted back in jail. Okai is 33 and has a tattoo of the words Tyrone R.I.P. on his right arm. He has links across Bedfordshire and Middlesex. Next is 28-year-old Michael Lee Lloyd. Detectives from the National Crime Agency want to question him in connection with a conspiracy to import Class A drugs. He has friends and family across North London and full sleeve tattoos on both arms. Now, do you recognise Mihail Ikim? He was charged with rape but failed to turn up at court last August. He's originally from Romania and speaks very little English. Ikim is 29 with a large pointy nose and has links to Bristol and Romford in North East London. And lastly, number eight is Stephen McGowan. Detectives want to talk to him in connection with a conspiracy to supply heroin and crack cocaine. He has links to Cheshire and Merseyside and is 29 years old. If you know where any of the faces are, then get in touch using the numbers on screen. You can take another look on the Crime Watch website and they're all on the red button until the early hours. In February, the manager of a petrol station in Walsall in the West Midlands was violently attacked and robbed as he tried to cash in his takings at a local post office. Now, not only was it all captured on CCTV, but the victim's seven-year-old son was sitting in the car and saw the attack on his dad. DI Colin Mattinson is from West Midlands Police and he's investigating this case. Detective, exactly when and where did this happen? Well, it was uh, Saturday the 7th of February at 10 past 11 in the morning when the man manager, Mr Sitam Paranatham, was on his way from his workplace, the garage, to the post office on Hall Street, Darleston, uh, to deposit £4,000 worth of takings. You've got some quite shocking CCTV of yes. the attack. Just talk us through what we're about to see. Well, you can see he parks his car outside the post office when um, a red Audi swings round the corner and two masked males ambush him and then strike him with blocks of concrete. The third male then squirts the fire extinguisher in his direction. Then as the Audi goes out of shot, squirts it in his face um, before they steal the takings and um, make off. Do we know anything about the men and about that Audi? Well, we're looking for um, an Audi, a red Audi saloon um, on the registration plate, which is a false plate, A61HBH. They left in that vehicle and we're, we're seeking people that may have seen that vehicle on that day, seen the plates being changed or found the vehicle abandoned. A61HBH. If you've seen that car, do get in touch, Detective. Thank you very much. Horrific level of violence, all in front of the victim's son too. Thankfully, both are now recovering from that ordeal. They didn't ask for the money. If, you are, if they ask for the money, they, they, you know they come for the money. I thought 
they're going to stab or they're going to kill me or i remember the white powder everywhere all over me and i couldn't see nothing and very frightening moment there was uh, i really worried about my son i didn't know where is he and the, i thought they're going to take the car as well because he is inside i believe it's not only me if they out there it will happen for somebody else as well if you have any information on who these men are do call the studio now on the usual number here it is 0500 600 600 well, the phones are very busy tonight, which is great news. So let's just grab a quick update with DCI John Brent, who's investigating that murder of Tipu Sultan in South Shields. Detective, what has come in? Yeah, we've had some really interesting calls so far this, this evening. Some people actually put names of people forward that they believe are responsible for this horrendous crime. But we still would appeal for some information regarding that CCD3 footage that we put out tonight of the guy in front of the the Indian takeaway on that particular night. We've not had a call about that and we're really keen to hear from somebody who knows who that individual is. That's the first time we've seen that CCTV. Important to stress, you're very open-minded, I would imagine, about that individual. Yeah, yeah, very much. Uh, it, he may have been a significant witness and if, if that person has seen the footage tonight or somebody that knows him, please, we need to talk to that person. He may have seen something really significant. And the small silver car that you mentioned as well? Yeah, the, the small silver car. We believe Fiesta or Corsa was at the rear of the premises just before this all happened. Uh, and we're really keen to find out again, could be another significant witness who may have seen something on the night. And again, for anybody who might know the whereabouts of that mm -hmm. motorcycle, particularly really distinctive, um, know who was using that motorbike on the night or where it went after the commission of the crime. Detective, thank you. We have some really impressive results on previous cases to tell you about this month, particularly on the wanted faces. In our last programme, we asked for your help in finding murderer William Kerr, who'd absconded after being released early from prison. Just minutes after the appeal went out, a viewer phoned in to say Kerr was in central London. Our cameras followed officers as they made their move the very next day. Wait okay. the camera. Okay, these are from Crime Watch, okay? Right. We put out an appeal on Crime Watch. I know and he did. Yeah. camera off, please. Okay, go. He told officers he was just seconds from hiding amongst this huge crowd of cyclists and leaving London. But in fact, less than 24 hours after the Crime Watch appeal, he was back behind bars. The Crime Watch appeal uh, has, has been our biggest success to date in relation to this investigation. Okay. Without that information, we wouldn't have known where he was. And, you know, with the public's help, um, it's, it's helped trace a dangerous offender. Nothing more, than, nothing more than that, he's a dangerous offender. Great result. And in December last year, we asked for your help in finding another wanted face. It was Desmond Rosario. The 46-year-old barrister failed to turn up at court to face charges of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old girl in Sheffield. Well, Rosario had fled abroad, but he was arrested when he returned to the UK and found guilty 11 days ago in jail for four years. Detectives say the Crime Watch appeal played a vital role in getting him back to the country and being brought to justice. Also in December last year, we showed you this man, Kevin Okoro. As a direct result of the appeal, he was arrested and earlier this month found guilty of kidnap, robbery, false imprisonment and conspiracy to supply Class A drugs. He's due to be sentenced next month. Now, in January last year, we asked for your help in finding 36-year-old Lamin Toure for a series of sexual attacks on women. Well, a viewer called the programme that very night, giving information which led officers to an address in Leeds where he was arrested. Last week, Toure pleaded guilty to attempted rape, two offences of sexual assault and attempting to pervert the course of justice. He was handed a 12-year jail sentence. Finally, in January, we appealed for your help following the theft of trophies from the Infinity Red Bull Formula One team's headquarters in Milton Keynes. You may remember the Formula One car we had in the studio. Well, the latest is that four men have now been arrested in connection with the thefts and are currently in custody. We'll obviously keep you updated on that and all the other cases when we can. 
Last week, Victorino Chua was jailed for life for murdering and poisoning patients that he was supposed to be caring for at the Stepping Hill Hospital in Stockport. It was the culmination of a painstaking investigation involving more than 30,000 pages of evidence and nearly 700 witnesses. Tonight, for the first time, the detectives and the scientists involved reveal the full story of how they caught a killer nurse. On the 15th of July, 2011, Zubia Aslam fell seriously ill while being treated at Stepping Hill Hospital. It looked as if she'd fallen into a diabetic coma, but Zubia wasn't diabetic. I just remember waking up wet, tried to lift myself up, couldn't lift, uh, tried to speak, couldn't speak. My body was just not doing what I wanted it to do. The only thing that was working was my mind. Zubia had suffered a hypoglycemic event where blood sugars fall to dangerously low levels and the body begins to shut down. As a precaution, medics removed her drip. Only diabetics should suffer these so-called hypos, but at least a dozen patients at the hospital had needed emergency treatment for them in the previous fortnight. At the same time, medical staff also discovered that some supplies, including saline bags and vials used for intravenous drips, had been tampered with. The police were called in. It was immediately recognised that she'd been poisoned by insulin. We didn't know the extent of the poisoning, we didn't know the source of the poisoning, we didn't know um, what mechanism was being used to actually uh, poison patients. The size of the problem was enormous. If given to a non-diabetic patient, insulin can cause severe, life-threatening hypoglycemic events. Three patients had recently died following unexpected hypos. You may become quite confused. Uh, you may get spots before the eyes. You come out in a cold sweat. Uh, your heart is pounding. You start having seizures. And you may uh, lapse into unconsciousness from which you don't recover. Diabetic hypos are fairly common on acute wards, so detectives had to narrow down who'd actually been poisoned and who would have experienced them anyway. We found 42 patients who had experienced unusually low blood sugar levels. For each of these 42 patients, we had to go through in very, very fine detail every single point of their treatment. We then effectively condensed that down to 21 victims who we felt we could prove had been poisoned. One patient who didn't recover was 44-year-old Tracy Arden. She had multiple sclerosis. She was admitted with a chest infection and although ill, her family were confident her treatment was working. However, on the 7th of July, 2011, her condition rapidly deteriorated. I got a phone call from her parents to say they'd gone to the hospital and Tracy wasn't very uh, in a very good condition. And then I got a phone call a little bit later to say she passed away. And that was a fairly short period of time. One evening, there's a knock on our door at the parents and it was the police. They had a concern that Tracy's death was potentially linked. It was a complete shock because it just puts you in a, in, a, in a complete spin. The police and the hospital management needed to stop the poisonings. The main priority for the Greater Manchester Police was to ensure the absolute safety of patients, things like security actually on the entrance to the ward, um, CCTV cameras within the treatment rooms, um, systems and processes around use of drugs. It became impossible actually to poison um, any patients on that ward. Now the poisonings had stopped, detectives could concentrate on finding the murderer on the wards. Police initially suspected nurse Rebecca Layton of murder. She was arrested a few weeks after the wards had been put into lockdown. 
but after six weeks in custody, police established she was not responsible for the poisonings and murders, and the charges were dropped. Six months passed with no further poisonings, but police still hadn't caught the murderer. Then, in January 2012, detectives were again called in to Stepping Hill. A number of patients had had their prescription records tampered with over the course of the night shift so that the nurses, effectively, who came on in the morning would then give higher prescriptions. Now, some of the drugs where the prescription had been altered were extremely dangerous. Some of them could have actually led to death. The tampering with patient notes could only have been carried out by staff working either on the 2nd or the 3rd of January 2012. Detectives looked at the 11 staff on duty, cross-referencing rotors from the two evenings when the majority of insulin poisonings had happened back in July. It revealed one name. There is only one member of staff who was on duty and working on those three occasions, and that was Victorino Chua. Victorino Chua had moved to the UK from the Philippines in 2002. He'd been working at the hospital for six years. Victory No Chua was always in the background, um, but he was not a suspect until um, the events of January 2012. What that allowed us to do was to look in, in finer detail at some of the actions that he'd been responsible for. What's most significant is that um, it's the lack of poisonings when Victorino Chua is not working on that ward. So when he's there or thereabouts, there are poisonings. Um, when he's not there, there are no poisonings. One key event was the poisoning of Grant Meisel on the 11th of July, 2011. He was left severely brain damaged after falling into a coma. Chua had taken a routine blood sample, which when later analysed, proved to be crucial in demonstrating his guilt. That patient was so poisoned with insulin and had such low blood sugar levels that they must have been comatose, unable to respond. And yet Victorino Chu in his nursing notes is saying that the person is alert, that he's spoken to them, that they are drinking a jug of water. In January 2012, Chua was arrested for the murders and poisonings. He spent two days in police custody answering questions. That's why I said I, I don't know, and I'm not the one. His house was searched, and one piece of key evidence was uncovered. Um, we found a, a, a long note in his kitchen drawer. There were quite a few entries within that note, um, which immediately appeared to be sinister. A nurse or a doctor will be familiar with the effects of insulin. So someone who gave insulin maliciously would know that this was hazardous to life. When detectives travelled to Manila in the Philippines, where Chua had trained to be a nurse, they were even more concerned. You are required to take in the Philippines uh, a nursing exam. The person who took that exam who provided a photograph of themselves in order to do the exam does not appear to me to be Victorino Chua. We would say that we can have no confidence um, that the qualifications he says he, he obtained, that they are bona fide. You record them as being alert and well. Simon and his team now believed they had enough evidence to prosecute Chua. His trial began in January of this year, but he protested his innocence at every opportunity. How do you explain this? No comment. However, the jury accepted the prosecution's evidence. Chua was found guilty of two murders and 19 poisonings and sentenced to a minimum of 35 years. From start to finish, this investigation has been a search for the truth. And I am very pleased that that truth, uh, we've been able to demonstrate that truth in a court of law. You know, we've got somebody that's guilty. You know, he's been sentenced, he's been put away. But we can't just trip a switch and go back to normal. The fear that's left and the scar that's left, you know, it may fade, but it will never go away. Now we have a, a sense of huge relief that 
the investigations have come to a conclusion they found somebody, they found the right person, and he has a sentence where he won't be able to harm anybody again. Incredibly detailed detective work to put that man behind bars. Well done to Simon and the team. Right, that's almost all we have for you tonight, but we've just time for a last check on the phones with Martin. Some excellent calls. We wanted your help with regards to that rape in Lewisham. We showed you some CCTV footage and a photo fit. We've had two possible names offered up for this man. We discussed the work of Operation Captura. We showed you a whole raft of names and faces. We've had a lot of interesting calls, particularly around these four gentlemen. Well, that's everything for now. Before we go, just let me tell you about the new series of Crime Watch Roadshow, which starts a week on Monday. Police! Police! Syria! Focusing on everyday crimes that affect us all. From burglars to dangerous drivers. It's the wrong side of the road. It's the right side of the road again now. Crime Watch Roadshow will be scouring the country appealing for your help to crack cases. From drug dealers to wildlife killers, your information could be the key to collaring some criminals. Put your hand behind you. Live every weekday morning at 9.15 on BBC One from Monday the 8th of June. Make sure you watch it. We will. Thanks, Rav. Please do remember to take a look at the Crime Watch website. It contains all of tonight's appeals and the police incident room phone numbers. You can also have another look at those wanted faces. They're on the red button, and that's available until 1 o'clock in the morning. Our phone lines stay open until midnight tomorrow, and we're going to be back with a late update. It's at a quarter to midnight tonight for viewers in England and Wales. It'll be quarter past midnight in Northern Ireland and just after half past 12 in Scotland, I'm afraid. We will, of course, also keep you up to date with all the latest developments. That's via Twitter, so follow at BBC Crime Watch. Thank you so much for all your calls tonight. Don't forget the roadshow starting on June the 8th. We're back again in July. From everyone here, goodbye.